guys, welcome to Hip Hughes History. My name is Mr. Hughes and I serve up the learnings through the YouTubes. We're so glad that you could be with us. Um, this is an AP Government Poli Sci lecture, um, really designed for high school students, but certainly if you're in middle school, college, even if you're cray cray on the internet, um, it's okay. You can stick around and see if we can't wrinkle your brain a little bit. But specifically, the United States Senate. And uh, when you're writing free responses, you're going to have to write about not only indirect democracy, we'll briefly mention that, but really not non-democratic principles that are built into the U.S. Constitution. I'm so excited, my hands are shaking. So sit back, wait a minute, ding dong, get up, go get the door, learning's here. All right, so let's see what we can do for you here. Uh, this actually stems from a tweet that uh, Jamie Gallagher sent me um, to a link to an article by Adam Liptick called Small State, Big State, I think it's called. I'll put it in the description below. Um, and it's a really great read on this topic, and specifically how the United States Senate is one of the least democratic institutions in the world. So that's what I'd like to take a look at. Um, let's briefly mention the history, and then we'll, we'll kind of get our teeth into uh, what, what the article goes into. But you guys know that the United States States Senate is formed um, during the Great Compromise, the Connecticut Compromise, and of course this is the deal that gives it two representatives per state in the United States Congress, correct? Right. So this would be Federalism 101, right? And those two senators represent all of the people of that state, right? And their votes count as much as anybody other's votes. And of course, we all understand basic ideas here. The House of Reps is uh, based on population, census, direct democracy. And of course, the United States Senate was formed out of the idea of indirect democracy, that the states would choose two representatives, and those two representatives would carry as much weight as all the other states. So we're going to talk about that number two, and that's most important in this lecture in a moment. But, you know, until the 17th Amendment, the Senate is very undemocratic in the sense that it's uh, indirect democracy. But why we're gathering around this electronic campfire right now is to specifically look at um, the idea of how undemocratic it is. And you would kind of question that and you would say, well, how is it undemocratic? We've had the 17th Amendment. People choose their legislatures. But what I really want to talk about is how small states hold a tremendous advantage in the United States Senate and really um, a tremendous advantage in federalism. Um, and this is free response material, guys. This is something that you could definitely write about. So um, Adam Liptick talks about this in the article, but um, I'll throw just some numbers at you. If you take, right, the 22 states with the lowest population, right, that's about 38 million people in those uh, 38 states. 22 states. I'm already messing math up. I suck at math. 22 states, right? 22 states, 38 million people. How many senators would they get? Can you do the math? It's 44, right? 22 states, 44 senators. So those 44 senators represent, right, 38 million people. Now, go to California. How many people does California have, roughly? 38 million people. So how many reps do those 38 million people get? They get two. So you have a, you know, what is it, 22 to 1 advantage in terms of the small states as a gathering faction, as a faction against the interest of California. So that's one example. Other examples would be Fresno, California has a half million people, right? And they get, you know, a fraction of that two because it's two for California. Wyoming is half a million people and they get two senators. So when you look at federal allocation dollars, who do you think needs it more? Is it Fresno, California or is it Wyoming? Um, and most people would say Fresno because you have higher urban populations and there's more costs associated with that. You have higher immigration costs, you have higher unemployment rates, uh, more infrastructure spending, more kids to educate. Yet, Wyoming gets more. Why is that? Well, probably because those two senators from Wyoming are doing their job correctly. They're porking it up for their state. And when you think about that, that's one issue in terms of funding and allocation that the small states have an advantage on. Another advantage that they have is on, is on public policy. And we can agree or disagree, and you guys can find it out in the comments about whether this is the best system. The point is, is this is the system, right? So um, if you look at a couple public policy issues, um, one being, say, um, gun control. Right? Where is gun control? And if we get something that's really popular in gun control, not something too controversial, maybe something like universal background checks. 
right? So that's got like 70, 80 percent approval rating. Even most conservatives, a majority of conservatives agree that everybody who buys a gun should have some type of background check. But that legislation gets stalled in the Senate. It's very hard to get through the Senate. Why is that? Well, if you look at the states that are more likely to oppose that type of legislation because you have a very, very red state, very, very right wing, very, very pro NRA, and you know, rightfully so if they want to be so, right? Those states um, have more representation than the states where you have large urban populations. There's not as many of those states. You can take, what, Illinois, New York, California, Florida, Right? But if I start adding up all the other states that are more pro-gun culture, I can do Alabama, I can do Alaska, I can do Arkansas, right? I can do North Dakota and South Dakota and Kansas and Nebraska, and we could keep playing this game. My numbers would add up faster. So we see issues like gun control, maybe even though democratically more people favor it, not being able to get through the Senate because of the small state advantage. Another example would be immigration, or urban centers and more liberal areas are more likely to favor immigration reform, rural areas less so. Global warming, um, rural areas and smaller states are more likely to be fossil fuel dependent and to look for those uh, fossil fuel industries as job creators and that's great. Very hard to get anything environmental like carbon emission controls out of the United States Senate. A couple other issues to throw at you. One would be the idea of the filibuster. Um, the filibuster is the minority holding power over the Senate and part of uh, the unwritten constitution to maybe hold up legislation and give the minority some power. So when you start looking at percentages and you start breaking it up and you look at, for instance, that Vermont and New York, it's like 30 to 1. Vermont citizens in the Senate have 30 times the representational power than New York. Um, the largest gap, I believe, is Wyoming and California, where it's like 66 to 1. Um, so if you look at it from that perspective, those citizens with very small, um, states with small populations, their senators, when they gather together and form 40, might only represent 15% of the country. So therefore, you have 15% Right, filibustering something that might be supported by 80 or 85 percent. And of course, this could work both ways. There are small states that are blue, like Rhode Island and Delaware. But the idea here is it's an undemocratic system and maybe designed so on purpose. We're not saying that's not true. But when you're writing in political science and you're looking for ideas that are undemocratic, this is one of them. Because this flies in the face of like the 1962 court ruling Baker versus Carr. Now, if you throw that in the essay, you're going to be a gangster, right? In 1962, I think it's a Texas case that's questioning um, the legislative lines that are being drawn for the House of Reps in Texas. It's a gerrymandering case. And one side is saying it's a political issue. If we want to draw the lines politically to gerrymander districts, we've won the state legislature. The Constitution gives the states the power to design these lines. Yo, then we gonna do it, I. And the court says, no, not I. Um, there's a concept in democracy, one man, one vote, that everybody's vote is treated equally. And when you are balancing and weigh that with democratic, group, democratic groups and compasses and knives with a map, then you're denying people really their equal representation. But that doesn't apply in the Senate because the state gets two, and that's in the Constitution, and what you're going to do. Not only that, we have to finish this up because you got other YouTube videos to watch and you have real lives. But not only that, let's say you're out there in internet land and you're thinking, well, we should change that. All right, how do you change it? Article 5, right? We can get two-thirds of the state legislatures to kick it up and start the amendment procedure, or two-thirds of Congress and later three-fourths of the states. But this is doable. We can do it. Maybe we should go to a more proportional uh, representational system in the Senate, make it a little bit more you know, fair. And when you look at demographic shifts and you see that demographically the rural states are dropping in population and getting redder and redder and redder, but their states still maintain the two, and the larger states are getting higher and higher populations, and they're getting diluted into the two, that maybe it's time for a change. I'm not saying I believe that I'm being devil's advocate and you can take it or leave it, but let's say you want to do it. Well, go ahead and go try and do it and get the two-thirds. Two-thirds in Congress, two-thirds of the states, three-fourths or three-fourths later in the states, whatever the fraction is. Let's say it's a miracle and you do it. Psych! You can't.
The Constitution in Article 5 has specific language that says nobody's going to mess with a state's representation of two in the Senate unless the state gives consent. So even if you changed it. So the only way to change it is Armageddon, alien invasion, or a constitutional convention. It's really the third option that's the only viable one unless you believe in space invaders. So, there you go. I've spouted out a lot of things and a lot of nonsense. Read the article. The article clearly explains it. There's great stats and research and all that great stuff. But if you're looking for something to write about in terms of uh, undemocratic principles that are in the United States, you want to write about the United States Senate first from the indirect democracy standpoint point before the 17th Amendment, and then through not only the filibuster, but through public policy. That's really where the grid is. Um, looking at fossil fuels, global warming, gun control, immigration, and talking about how those issues, even though in polls might have popular support, the, um, the overabundance of power the small states hold in the Senate because of these population numbers um, stops that from happening. So there you go, chew on that, what are you gonna do? I don't wanna pout, I don't wanna shout, I don't even like sauerkraut, but hip hues is out. But before I'm out, make sure that you click the description below. There's really great EDU channels that if you haven't subscribed to, then you just cray cray, cray cray on the internet. So click down there. And if you haven't subscribed to me, then what are you doing? I need you. I need you, baby. All right, there, there we go, guys. So where attention goes, energy flows, I'm out of here. I can hear it right now. I'm gone. See ya.